find them the rubbing in because the time is coming in the next twelve because she must be about eighteen right now she's accomplished many more things that I could ever accomplish at any age really. So it's particularly moving to me to see a student from NYU who's returning who I've been in touch with for many, many years, who I've seen and we were just checking how we've met before. We've met in Florence twice, I think, over the last couple of years on different panels. So I hope to see all of you to return to NYU, to share with you, with us, your accomplishments, to tell us how we can improve, and to stay connected to this university. I wish you the best of luck. We are excited and look forward to what you will do. And I send you into the big white world and wear your purple proud. our keynote speaker, a 2013 alumna of Global Liberal Studies, Serena Gam. Serena began her NYU career as a core program student in Paris. She joined GLS as a sophomore. Not content with her own choice, Serena helped to persuade her brother, Max, to enter GLS, from which he graduated in 2014. Serena returned to Paris as a junior, where she, of course, pursued her independent research project, but in her spare time, founded Suitcase Magazine. Named by the Evening Standard as one of 25 under 25 most influential young Londoners, Serena led the magazine to international recognition and economic success. Suitcase now anchors a collection of lifestyle enterprises under that brand. Serena is already using her own success as a lever to give back to the community, participating actively in the London team of UNICEF's Next Generation. Please welcome back one of our own, Serena Gant. suitcase magazine. And although he'll deny it, it's thanks to this man sitting right over there, Dean Schwarzbeck. During my gap year, which was, God, <laughs> seven years ago now, I received a letter from NYU. I remember running and hiding in the bathroom to read it, not telling anyone. It was from Dean Schwarzbeck saying that I hadn't been accepted into CAS. Oh my God, I'd been rejected, I thought. I started to tear up. Then I reread it. I hadn't been rejected. I'd been accepted into the liberal studies program instead. Liberal studies, I recall thinking. What on earth is this? <laughs> then I read on. I'd be able to study literature, philosophy, history of art, and more. And best of all, I get to spend my freshman year in Paris or Florence. Pretty cool, no? Fast forward half a year I'm in Paris. It was so exciting. I'd lived there briefly before, but this was something quite different. And I was at university, aka independent. I loved Paris, but after a few months, I did start to feel like I was living in a bit of a bubble. Bubble, man. And my experiences were superficial. I decided that I needed to move out of dorms and moved in with a friend who was half French. From then my experience had totally changed. I saw a completely different sides of the city, which was so awesome that I had to write it down to share it with my friends. Every time my friends would come to visit, I would send them this guide, even if they didn't want it. Time flew and before I knew it, I was a sophomore in New York. I was so eager to be there, but when I arrived, I found that I actually didn't really like it. I'm sure you can picture your first day here. On my first day in New York, there was a line going around the block just to get into the Silver Center to use the elevator. 
It was loud, it was crowded, it was dirty. <laughs> but <laughs> I knew that I needed to get a grip. Like Paris, knew it was only going to be what I made of it. So again, I threw myself wholeheartedly into college life, which basically meant New York life. That's the beauty of NYU, I suppose. Since there's no campus, you're almost learning to live in the real world, but with this whole network of support. And again, I want to share my experience with my friends, so I put together Serena's ultimate guide to New York City. People seem to really like it, and by this point, New York had opened my mind and grown on me a little bit. I learned that anything is possible here. That American dream that everyone talks about was a really tangible thing. But one thing that really stood out to me were the people here in New York. They were so driven and so passionate about what they were doing. They didn't want to waste a minute on things that weren't leading anywhere. Whenever you meet someone in New York, they'll ask you three questions. First, your name, obviously. Second is, where do you live? Being English, at first I thought that was highly intrusive and quite rude. <laughs> but then I realized that they were asking what I discovered only a few months earlier moving to New York City. So the city was what you made of it, and which neighborhood you chose to live in defined your lifestyle choices, and as a result said quite a lot about who you were. The third question was always, what do you do? That final question really got me thinking. What do I do? Well, I study. I'm doing a training program at LVMH on a cannon, and I party down the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> but why is all this reading? I didn't know, so I wanted to be able to answer that question. I spent my sophomore summer nearly but not quite launching a career in film and traveling. And I noticed that at that point, my friends had started to rely on me for travel recommendations. And not only that, but insights into the different places. Things that I learned from living there from people that I met along the way. That was what was really interesting. These things were obvious to me. There didn't seem to be a single overarching media source that they could turn to. For example, on my trip to Japan, I learned that people, Japanese people eat sushi with their hands. I'd be very confused if you order salmon avocado roll, because it doesn't exist over there. And in New York, something I'm sure you're all very aware of, people date constantly, but don't commit, because like everything, there's far too many options. <laughs> <laughs> my brain jumps into action. How can I share these insights with more people and get them to really know these cities and places? Should I start a blog? No, but that defeats the purpose because I want locals and people who really know what they're talking about to have their voice heard, not mine. What do I know? Okay, a magazine. Never worked in publishing before. No problem. How hard can it be? <laughs> the answer is, it is very hard. <laughs> but it's not impossible. My junior year back in Paris, I found some amazing people to tell me about their favorite parts of the city. And in six months, I cobbled together two things. A curated travel publication, which launched just after my finals in the summer of my junior year. Obviously, it was not easy doing this at the same time as the school. Having never worked in publishing before and not knowing anyone else who did was also challenging. I'd actually Googled how to start a magazine at one point. But inexperience in the GLS framework made me research and question everything. I knew that because I didn't have a background in publishing or the experience, I should focus first on what I do know, how to travel and a young female audience. I read every magazine I could get my hands on, online and print. And I did a survey to see what my audience might want. Print was by far the most popular option, actually, much to my surprise. Thus disproving the internetism that print is dead. Print is not dead evolving like everything else I learned. Computers don't look the same as they did 10 years ago, so why should magazines? So I did just that and made suitcase look more like a luxury product, a coffee table book. I took off all the text on the cover trying to hard sell the content. I also made it smaller, because why do magazines never fit in women's handbags? <laughs> the process was incredibly tough, but I don't know how to describe it. It was like something switched on inside my head and nothing was too big a task to fulfill. I could work for 24 hours straight without getting bored or moving. If I'd applied the same amount of effort to my schoolwork, I'd probably be a professor by now. <laughs> that summer was a real whirlwind. I won an award, tripled our sales, and we got huge amounts of press. Oh, we did pop-up jobs too. But before I knew it, summer was over and I had
have to go back to school for my final year at New York. It was a fun moment leaving my office back in London with a small but growing team and so much excitement to go back to university. But with often with things, there is no right time, and I knew that if I didn't finish now, I would go back for a while. Plus, I managed my third year just fine. Kind of. Over the summer, I developed a slightly naive optimism. I remember very clearly going to Professor Riali's class, the first on the semester for our thesis. We'd been assigned a book to read. What it was escapes me now. She looked at me and said, So, what can you tell me about the book? So I told her the title, the author, and I gave her a synopsis. She said, So, what can you tell me about the book? <laughs> Show me the first page. Trying to be clever, I pointed out the cover and she said, No. Then I went to the first page of the introduction. No, she said. The first page of the book is the one which has the title, where it was published, by who and when. Once you know all of these things, then you can read the book. I went home after class that day and I freaked out a little. In essence, I started suitcase for that very reason. There's so much biased information out there about different cultures that I really just wanted to set the record straight and give people a proper toolkit to explore these places for themselves. But it made me think, I'm putting my magazine out there to thousands of people. What are my interests and biases, my blind spots? I conquered the New York question of what do you do, but now I had a new question to answer. I've got a voice, what I wanted to say. I'm very aware that I'm not going to fix the entire world and every cultural bias in one fell swoop, so I had to be clever about it. I did some serious soul searching and decided my key message was to inspire people to travel consciously. I wanted people to travel with a purpose, to think about what they wanted to get out of their trips and choose their destinations accordingly rather than blindly following some hot list. I wish they would travel curiously. Yeah. I hope that people will be spurred on by what they read in the suitcase to explore more, research more, aiming for deeper, more local experiences, like the GLS program. And finally, to encourage people to travel carefully. Travel is not a one-way street. We travel for many different reasons but mainly because the place we're going to is different from where we're coming from. I don't go to Tokyo to shop at H&M, and I don't think the rest of you do either. My second major goal was to champion the support leaders of today and tomorrow in these different cultures, particularly female. They often say it's the people that make the places. I felt that if people could just understand each other's cultures better, a lot of the problems in the world could be solved. So, as you can tell, between classes and re redefining my entire brand, there was quite a lot happening. In fact, it became a bit too much, so I decided to take control of my life once again, like I'd done in Paris and New York before, and stop printing for six months. Everyone told me that I was crazy. I had momentum and a pause would kill the publication. But they were wrong. And after graduation, I came back with a structure that they didn't have before and a much better plan. That September, I released the next edition of Suitcase. Yes, it took a few months to regain momentum that it had before the business got going, it was so much, but it was so much stronger and faster than before. And I realized at this point, you can take advice from other people, but at the end of the day, only you really know. And sometimes it's good to trust your instinct. Last month, we read in 183 countries. And last week, I realized one of my major goals of bringing the magazine to life by executing our first ever female cultural exchange in Taipei. We brought over five female entrepreneurs from all corners of the globe and created a program immersed in a Taiwanese culture, just like our first semester at NYU. We also matched with five leading female Taiwanese entrepreneurs and we helped panel for local universities and other ambitious females. The result was phenomenal. The point of me telling you my story is not to show off or to tell you that you all need to start your own businesses to be successful, but I wanted to demonstrate to you how GLS has helped me. Most people at this stage in their lives don't know what they want to be unless they have a real vocation like a lawyer or a doctor. So try to listen and absorb everything. There are doors that will open and you may think it's not an important one, but it might be your most important door ever. Keep being curious and pay attention because sometimes you learn and you don't even know you're learning. Luckily, you don't need to be the smartest or most useful to succeed. A lot of the most successful people in the world are not the people that you read about in the newspapers or see on TV. They could be the person who invented something unglamorous like the cash payment system that you use every day. 
only can, can you clean a restaurant in a place they love? Or your mum, who's the best mum in the world. <laughs> Success is all up here, and it's about having a positive effect on yourself and the world around you, no matter how big or small that effect may be. Success is not one size fits all, so if you truly want to get there, it is within reach. I've got two examples of people very close to me. In fact, they're both sitting right there, one of them is also a GLS graduate. To put it simply, my younger brother, Max, spent his childhood to early adulthood stressing out our parents by enjoying our, his life a little too much. <laughs> Max had always been very smart, but he had always applied his brain to the things that my parents quite wanted him to. When he got to NYU, the GLS program, he suddenly realized the opportunity he had been given. And literally from one day to the next, he stopped watching films all the time and started making them. We lived together at the time. He always used to be sitting on the sofa in the living room when I came home, so watching something. And one day I came back and he wasn't there. So I called him. Where are you? I'm making a movie. You're where? I'm producing a movie. Oh, okay, see you later then. <laughs> that movie went on to win Best Short Film at Beverly Hills Film Festival. And a couple of months later, he set up a company called Magna Carta and got his first client for commercial work from an app that a few of you may have used called Tinder. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he was recently awarded Best Direction by Adley to get some of the biggest agencies around the world. And he's produced a Super Bowl commercial and is on the Forbes 30 under 30 list for media. <laughs> like Max, uh, like me, Max has no previous experience in the field that he entered. He had so much passion and a crazy amount of knowledge because he watched so many movies. He'd been learning without even knowing what he'd been doing. Then he just worked harder than ever before to get where he wanted to be. He worked on every film project at NYU that he could get his hands on learning all aspects. In many ways, ASCII is everything. Infrastructure and a full business plan can come later, but getting a beta version of your, of your product ready, or just getting started should be a product of priority. Passion and drive can get you very far in life and can often outweigh other things like experience. Experience you can now read about on the internet or gain insight from others like your parents. Plus, you've got these amazing people right here who, because they're NYU professors, and not just incredibly bright, but also super connected around the entire world. But if you really want to be the best, you've got to keep developing yourself. Don't worry about that first step you need to take towards your career, because it by all means does not need to be your only one. My grandmother, who's sitting right there, after a long and very successful career in fashion, went back to university online five years ago to get her doctorate in psychology and is now the world's number one expert in traumatic brain injury. She works six days a week, two at her shop, four at the Wall Street Military Hospital. She's now also a scholar at Harvard, keeping them up to date with her research. So, <laughs> as you can see, there's no such thing as too old or too young. It's all a mentality, it's all up here. Once you have an idea of what you want, start building towards it instead of sitting on it. There's never going to be a perfect time or perfect age. You have no idea what life might throw at you tomorrow, so it's worth trying it out from today. No matter how big your idea is, there are always baby steps you can take towards reaching your dream. You can also have more than one dream. And don't use other people's markers of your own success and happiness for those dreams. We live in a world where the media preys on our insecurities to make us feel very bad about ourselves and jealous of other people who are supposedly doing better than us. Yes, good and bad things happen, and yes, we can't always choose where life is going to take us, but our success is dependent on what we make of every single opportunity that comes our way. Be open to everything and support each other and others around you. Instead of being jealous of a friend's success, try genuinely to be happy for change. Or if that's really not possible, try to use that discontent to spur your own success. And when all else fails, try to gain perspective. One thing I learned very early on is that a career is very important but only in context for other things. That's why it's vital to prioritize. Once you're stuck into the world of work, it's very hard to come out and you can often lose perspective of what really matters. So 
Spend time with your friends and family. Take a break. Stay healthy. Without those things, what is a career? Make time for what you enjoy on a daily or weekly basis. Not all saved up for the holidays. You need balance and it'll be reflecting what you do and produce. I personally maintain perspective through my work with UNICEF. On days where literally everything is going wrong, our printers have gone fast and are holding up stock hostage or our website has crashed, I can actually look at the bigger picture and say, this is not a life or death situation. Yes, this sucks, but no one's going to die if the website crashes. It can be fixed. There's only one tiny thing in my life going wrong when I have a lot else to be grateful for. Life is all about problem solving, and luckily there are an infinite number of ways to solve the same problems. So get out there, be open, remember what's really important to you, prioritize, decide what your individual success will look like, build and go for it with an open heart and mind. If you fail, there's always tomorrow. Do it again, you're more than ready, and you've already overcome one hurdle. Congratulations, graduates.